Hey football fans and welcome to The Coordinator Project. In this video, we're looking at Tony Elliott, who was Clemson's offensive coordinator in 2020, but I'll be hitting coordinators from all over the country this offseason, so be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell to get notified whenever a new breakdown posts. Elliott's been affiliated with Clemson in one way or another for most of his football career. He started out there as a college player from 2000 to 2003 under Tommy Bowden and his offensive coordinator at the time, Rich Rodriguez. Once his playing days were over, he had short stints as wide receiver coach at South Carolina State in Furman, but he was soon invited back to his alma mater as a running backs coach in 2011. Over the last decade since then, he's risen through the ranks entirely at Clemson, getting a promotion to co-offensive coordinator in 2015 before becoming the full OC in 2020, so he was completely in control of the 2020 offense that we're about to study. To understand the origins of Elliott's offense, we really need to look at how Clemson's offense has developed over the last decade. When Elliott was promoted to co-coordinator back in 2015, he and co-coordinator Jeff Scott, who's now the head coach of South Florida, had both already been on the staff as offensive assistants. When they became co-coordinators then, they were largely trying to preserve and replicate the offense run by their former boss, offensive coordinator Chad Morris, who'd moved on to the head coaching job at SMU. Morris's offensive history is interesting because he's the first coordinator that I've discussed on here whose system goes back to his days as a high school coach. In 2003, Morris took over as the head coach at Stephenville High in Texas, a program that had recently won four state championships under Art Bryles. In Morris's first season, Stephenville missed the playoffs for the first time in 15 years, and he was looking for an offensive shakeup to get things back on track. That offseason, he ran across a recently published book, The Hurry Up, No Huddle, An Offensive Philosophy, written by none other than Gus Malzahn. Malzahn's most famous for his eight years as Auburn's head coach, but back in 2003, he too was a high school coach working at Springdale High in Arkansas. Malzahn's offense had been heavily influenced by the wing tee run at Delaware by Harold Tubby Raymond, who had himself written a book on his system back in 1986. When Malzahn got his first high school head coaching job back in 1992, he apparently lifted Raymond's philosophy word for word, and then went on to mesh it with the spread trends that were starting to sweep the country, leading to the fast-paced, high-scoring, spread-to-run offense that was soon to get him attention in college coaching communities. When Morris's offense struggled in 2003 then, this was the offense that he wanted to learn, and so he reached out to Malzahn through a friend of a friend and flew his staff out to Arkansas to learn the system. From that point on, Malzahn and Morris had kind of parallel careers. Malzahn became the offensive coordinator at Tulsa in 2007, and Morris got the same position shortly after that in 2010. After leaving Tulsa, Malzahn went on to a Power 5 position as the offensive coordinator at Auburn, and Morris did the same thing at Clemson in 2011. Tony Elliott was hired in that very same year and would go on to work in Morris' system for four seasons before taking it over as co-coordinator in 2015. So what does this offense look like? To get into it, let's start from the original source. Here's how Malzahn describes his version of the offense. We're a two-back run-play-action team. We're not a spread team. Oh, they run the spread. No, we're a two-back run-play-action team. When Malzahn talks about being a two-back offense, he's talking about his frequent use of 20 personnel, by which I mean formations like this one that we're seeing from Clemson, with two running backs, zero tight ends, and three wide receivers. These two-back sets will generally see a true running back lined up next to the quarterback in the shotgun or behind him in the pistol, and then the second back will be a hybrid tight end slash H-back style player. For this video, I broke down Clemson's 2020 games against Miami and Notre Dame, and in those games, the Tigers used this kind of two-back alignment with an H-back in the backfield just over 40% of the time. In actuality, they were in this personnel grouping much more often than that, it's just that in many cases they'd split that H-back out wide or put him on the line of scrimmage as a tight end, so they weren't always in a true two-back look when he was on the field. Combined with this formational flexibility out of this personnel grouping, one of the most important features of Elliott's Clemson offense is that he has a ton of ways to run the ball out of each of these looks, and to get a sample of this, let's focus on one specific blocking scheme, Elliott's two-back power run game. We'll start with the boring version of this play. Clemson's in a slanted backfield here, so that means that they've got a running back offset to one side of the quarterback in the shotgun, and then their H-back is lined up on the wing to the opposite side. On a two-back power play, they're going to use that H-back to kick out the end man on the line of scrimmage, as we're seeing right here. This is establishing the right edge of the hole. The left edge of the hole is then created by the offensive line, who are all going to block down, or back in the direction away from where the play is going. So on this play, they're running power to the right, and so the offensive line will all block down to the left, building a wall and creating the left edge of the hole. The last key element of any power play is that it'll then take the backside offensive guard and pull him through that hole that's just been created, leading the running back up to the playside linebacker right here. On this play, Miami's front does a nice job of compressing that lane, but this gives us a good look at power in its most basic form. It's got those three components. We've got an H-back kickout block, 
play side down blocks by the offensive line, and then that pulling backside guard leading through the hole. Now, let's add a layer of complexity to this blocking scheme. When you're a defensive coordinator or a player, one of the things that you're always trying to do is read backfield tendencies. On the last play, for example, we saw that Clemson used a slanted backfield just like the one that we're seeing here, and they did it to run power toward the H-back who was executing that kickout block. So a hypothetical defensive coordinator might think, when Clemson lines up in this backfield set, we need to be ready for power run toward the H-back. Where all of these Molson inspired offenses really shine then is in all of the ways that they can break tendencies like this, and they'll often do this with the heavy use of a mobile quarterback in the run game. On this play, for example, even though the H-back is lined up to the left, we're going to see all of those other elements of power working to the right, away from the H-back and toward the side of the running back's alignment. If we pause the play right here, we see play side down blocks from the offensive line, and we see a pulling back side guard, so that's two out of three power assignments. All that we're missing is the kickout block on this defensive end. That's the guy that had been kicked out by the H-back on the previous play, but now with the H-back on the other side of the formation, what's the offense going to do? On this play, instead of blocking that end man, Clemson's going to read him, so the quarterback's going to attack down inside to the same side as the running back's alignment. In essence, he's playing the role of the running back on this power play, and meanwhile the actual running back is going to widen and get into a pitch relationship with him. On this play, the defensive end comes down inside to take away the quarterback, but the quarterback's reading him, and so when he sees that guy squeeze down inside to close up this lane, he's just going to pitch it out to the running back. So, instead of accounting for that defensive end with a kickout block from the H-back, Clemson's accounting for him with this pitch option. If that defensive end would have instead widened to take away the running back, then the quarterback would have turned the ball up inside for himself. By accounting for that defensive end with a read instead of with a kickout block, Clemson's able to run what is, in essence, a two-back power play, even though they don't have a blocking back at the point of attack. Now that we've seen how a quarterback read can replace the block of an H-back, we can understand how Clemson can use their quarterback to run two-back power, even when they don't have two backs in the backfield. And here they're going to do it while breaking yet another backfield tendency. On the last play, we saw that the quarterback attacked to the side of the running back's alignment, and we saw the running back work into a pitch relationship with him to attack the edge. As we saw, this pitch option effectively blocked the play side defensive end, while the rest of the offensive line just ran normal power. On this play, there's no H-back at all, and Clemson's going to run power away from the side of the back's alignment, breaking the tendency that was established on the last play. On this variant, the quarterback, instead of a pitch man, is going to be the guy attacking outside on the edge. When he attacks the edge, it forces this playside defensive end to widen with him. And when he does this, the quarterback's just going to throw a shovel pass back inside to the running back, who cuts it up inside of that defender. Meanwhile, of course, the offensive line's just blocking two back power again. Here we see playside down blocks creating the right edge of the hole, with the backside guard pulling to lead up to the playside linebacker. For the offensive line, none of these plays have been different. All of the differences come in the formation and in the backfield action. In spite of all that thought and versatility that goes into Clemson's run game, when you look at the stats, they don't look like an offense built exclusively around it. In 2020, for example, the Tigers were only 103rd in the country in rushing attempts per game, and in the two games that I broke down, only 38% of their plays went to either the quarterback or the running back on called runs. These stats are a little bit misleading, though, because Clemson also didn't rely a lot on a pure dropback passing game, with that part of their offense accounting for just 35.6% of their play calls. What's left, then, is roughly a quarter of their offense, which consists of screens, throws off of RPOs, and play-action rollouts off a hard-run action. The most accurate characterization of Clemson's offense, then, is that roughly 65% of their play calls are trying to pry open space underneath to take what the defense gives them, and that could show up as runs, RPOs, screens, or rollouts. The downfield portion of their offense, then, makes up the last 35% of the offense. While Clemson's run game gave them more versatility than most other 20 personnel offenses, they didn't show as much variety in the dropback passing game, although they were pretty dense in two and three receiver strong side route combinations, especially attacking outside the hash marks. In the games that I studied, though, this section of their offense was still able to give them most of the answers that they needed to supplement the run slash screen slash rollout game that we just talked about. Let's start with this play where Notre Dame's playing cover one, a man coverage with a single high safety playing in the deep middle. On this play, Clemson's attacking that man coverage by running a switch with these two strong side receivers. Notre Dame's playing tight with their defensive backs, putting them on the same level close to the line of scrimmage, but when these receivers cross with each other, it creates traffic for this defensive back to run through. Because of this, he has to rush to climb over the top of this traffic, and so his momentum puts him in a tough spot when his receiver bends back inside and bangs it down the seam. 
by crossing their receivers in this way. Clemson's able to make life hard for defensive backs who are trying to play tight man coverage like this, and that helps the receiver get behind them. On this play, Notre Dame's running a coverage that would be a lot stronger against that kind of switch concept. Down here at the bottom of the screen, we see a split safety zone coverage, so against a switch concept, they'd have two defensive backs lined up over the top of the two strong side receivers, and since it's zone, those guys aren't going to be at risk for getting picked by the switch. They're then adding their rover into coverage, letting them play a three-on-two triangle over these receivers. From this position, that rover is potentially able to pick up any routes breaking back inside and underneath of those off-defensive backs, while also being in position to get into the run fit against outside runs, letting Notre Dame preserve a seven-man run fit against Clemson's six blockers. So, if you have strong coverage over the top into the inside like this, where do you attack? The weak spot here is most likely going to be to the sidelines, and so Clemson's just going to use their outside receiver to run off the cornerback and clear out space down the sidelines. Once that cornerback's out of the picture, the slot receiver is going to break outside on a corner route underneath of him, and of course, it's always going to help when your quarterback can throw a corner route all the way to the sidelines from the far hash mark like this. While the sidelines were a weak spot on the previous play, Notre Dame's doing more to fortify them on this one. This is a second and four, and so the Irish are playing with a reasonably tight outside cornerback right at the sticks. Basically, they don't want to give up a first down on something like a speed out or a hitch. They're also running a blitz on this play with this linebacker attacking the line of scrimmage. The problem here is that when you take that blitzer out of coverage, you're weakening the inside of your coverage a little bit, and that's what Clemson's exploiting here. First of all, they're going to use this number three receiver right here to clear out the middle of the field by running down the seam. Notre Dame's rocking their weak safety down into the box to replace the blitzer here, but when that receiver goes vertical, the safety has to run with him, taking yet another defender out of the intermediate middle of the field. From there, they're just running a sucker concept to put a high-low stretch on this rover right here. In a sucker concept, the number two receiver is going to run a quick hitch right at the sticks, and the number one receiver is then going to run a seven-step slant behind him. On this play, the rover stays pretty tight to the sticks, opening up space behind him and giving that slant access to the middle of the field. The quarterback steps up in the pocket to avoid the rush and hits that receiver who, thanks to the clearing route that we saw at the start of this play, is going to have a lot of room to keep working across the field for the touchdown. Clemson was able to use switches and high-low reads like this to great effect as a way to supplement their run and screen games. Alright, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, you might consider hitting the thumbs up button down below to like it. The more likes, the more YouTube will recommend these videos to other people, so it really helps to support the channel. Also, if there's a coordinator that you want to see on here, let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Otherwise, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to get notified whenever a new breakdown goes up, and I'll see you here next time.